Good morning and welcome to session two of day three of Streaming Media East Connect 2021. This is our fourth virtual event and it's our biggest one yet. We have 33 panels and sessions over this week and into next Monday. And then we've got the Content Delivery Summit on next Tuesday, May 25th. We've got one more virtual event coming up in August. More information will be available about that soon. But we are also planning on returning to our in-person events with Streaming Media West in Huntington Beach in November. Steve Nathans Kelly will put a link to that in the chat. And if you're interested in speaking at Streaming Media West or sponsoring, all the information can be found there. And we'll be working on getting the program for that event online sometime in late June, I believe. As always, all of the sessions from our Streaming Media Connect events will be available on demand on our YouTube channel within a day or so of them being live. Steve's gonna post that link in the chat as well. And you can also find the link to our videos on the streamingmedia.com website by clicking on the big surprise, the videos link, and then selecting conference videos. A Couple of housekeeping notes. We will have the chat open during this Zoom, but we do request that if you have questions for the panelists, you put them in the Q&A tab. That makes it a lot easier for us to keep track of them. And we will then forward those questions to the panel moderator who will ask them of the panelists if we have time. So with that said, before we jump into the panel, uh, we have a brief message from our diamond sponsor, Signiant, who is helping make all of this possible. When the director calls action. And action. When the game is on. Kick it up, it's good. Or it's time to save the universe again. Media Shuttle is there. Trusted by more than 25,000 media companies, Media Shuttle delivers, making it easy and secure to send any size file anywhere fast. The journey begins with Media Shuttle portals, customized and branded for any project and designed to be so easy, your end users will love it. All while giving operations teams complete control through a simple yet powerful admin interface. Add users, set permissions, customize file delivery specs, and report on all activity. Blast off with proprietary acceleration technology. Media Shuttle moves your content anywhere in the internet connected world at hyper speeds. Along the way, your files are protected. Our commitment to enterprise grade security has made Media Shuttle a preferred tool with Hollywood studios, major sports leagues, broadcasters, and more. With Media Shuttle, your files are never handed over to Signiant. File movement is orchestrated between the end user's workstation and your storage, whether on prem or in the cloud. Your IT team simply provisions your storage, connecting it to the Media Shuttle cloud service, and Signiant handles the rest. Get started on your Media Shuttle journey today, a journey without limits. I'd also like to thank the sponsor of this session, Discover Video, and Discover Video's Rich, Rich Mavroganis will be joining the panel in just a moment. Now, of all the things that have changed in the last 15 months or so, perhaps none have changed so much as education. So I can't wait to hear our panelists talk about how video learning works in 2021, the lessons they've learned in the last 15 months and where they think things are headed. So with that, let me introduce our moderator, Liam Moran, Liam. Thank you, Eric. So in the United States, we appear to have passed the inflection point for the COVID-19 pandemic due to loss of habitat for the virus from rising immunity levels in the population. Gain both the easy way through vaccination and the hard way through infection. Two weeks of quarantine and recovery. Humanity is not out of the woods yet, though. A friend in India is every day scrounging for oxygen tanks, ventilators, and hospital beds for residents of his neighborhood. But the end is in, within reach. For educational video and learning at home, the pandemic created a surge in demand unlike anything ever seen, at the very least since Jane Fonda's workout flew off the shelves 39 years ago. Today's panel will look ahead at how to take the lessons learned from the past year and move teaching and learning with video forward into the new normal. I'm Leah Moran, supporting the production, pedagogical, and technological legs of curricular and event video at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I'm also the regular education columnist for Streaming Media Magazine. We'll go around the horn with panel introductions to get started. Justin? 
Hi, I'm Justin Troyer. I'm the Associate Director for Media Services at The Ohio State University. My department does digital media production for our online degree bearing programs, marketing, as well as internal communications. And I've been doing video for about 27 years. Chris? Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Martin. And no, not the Chris Martin from Coldplay, not the one that was married to Gwyneth Paltrow. I'm Chris Martin of the University of Pennsylvania, where I've been part of the IT department for the past 10 years. And one of my most important responsibilities in that role is supporting the Kelly Writers House, which is a haven for writers. Uh, we have a live event space there that streams daily programs during the semester and makes those videos available for replay on demand. We also house several podcasts out of our audio recording studio. We have the world's largest audio archive of poets reading their own work on the internet uh, at pensound.com. Uh, pensound and we also uh, house a MOOC, a massive open online course since 2012 on modern and contemporary American poetry out of the Kelly Writers House, which features hundreds of pre-recorded videos as well as a live webinar series where students are given the opportunity to interact with the professor and his teaching assistant. And it's had hundreds of thousands of enrollments over the past 10 years. I'll jump in. Thanks, Chris. Justin, good to see you. Uh, I'm Scott Nelson. I'm also with The Ohio State University in our Office of Distance Education. Um, I manage our instructional media team, and we work closely with a, a, a large team of instructional designers and a, a, a very large portfolio of courses around Ohio State. And, and our team's goal is really to, to help those instructors create engaging, um, rich um, instructional media. And so really, um, whether it's us custom building content for them or helping them learn how to do it on their own, um, we just make those online courses a little more engaging, a little more exciting than what uh, many of us have known in the past as uh, very text heavy PDF voiceover PowerPoint experiences. So uh, that's my role. Love what I do. I get very excited about it. So I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Rich Maverick is here. Um, uh, this, I'm the uh, CEO of Discover Video, and uh, we've been doing or I've been doing streaming video since before streaming media magazine existed. So we go back to the, to the very beginning. Here at Discover Video, we uh, help our customers mostly uh, uh, in the education space, K through 12 colleges and universities, uh, deliver compelling content um, on their local network. So a lot of premise-based solutions. And uh, since the pandemic, an explosion of uh, internet-based content as well. So I look forward to this discussion. Thank you, panelists. So to uh, kick off, so uh, video adoption in education has been growing, you know, for the past 20 years at the very least. But in the, in the uh, last March, everybody, every teacher was forced to uh, become a, a video uh, teacher. Every student was, to, was forced to become a student of video. A lot of these people did it skeptically and unwillingly. So as a result of this, do we believe that the uh, acceptance of online education was helped or harmed by this uh, um, coercive adoption of the technology? And let's just go through the panel in the same order that we uh, introduce ourselves. So Justin. I think it was definitely helped. Um, you know, like you said. I'm sorry, Justin, but you re-muted yourself. Sorry. Um, I, um, I think it was definitely helped. Um, a lot of them didn't go along willingly, per se. Um, but since they were forced to, um, they had to adopt. And it actually sh showed that it wasn't that hard for them to do so. And a lot of the unwilling ones have become willing because they just realized that it is, it is easy. I agree. This is a fascinating, fascinating question, Liam. And this is what I've thought about almost nonstop for the past three weeks. It's fascinating because there's so many intricacies, like in terms of online acceptance. Are you talking about K through 12 students, the parents of K through 12 students, students formerly enrolled in a university, part or full time uh, teachers, or just adults in general? And then there's the technical variables. I'm sure your experience learning online was much different if your internet connection was not reliable. But uh, just what's most interesting to me by far is the adult community 
and measuring their acceptance. Uh, for one, it's the mass, vast majority of people in the world, just, just by, by, by default. And it's the first time that a lot of adults really thought for the first time about online, like taking an online course or decided to actually seriously pursue it. And I can say for our numbers at Penn, like our, our massive open online course enrollments went through the roof. We had 6x the number of enrollments in March of 2020 than we did in March 2019. And we're still doing about 2x, you know, what we were doing in, in 2019 at this time of year. So I think the iron is really hot. I think the, the pandemic will have a lasting effect because it removed a lot of the resistance, a lot of the friction that adults might have had. Like they don't know how to do online learning. They don't know the tools. I think they've, everyone's installed Zoom now. We've learned how to use Teams. They're like, we're not scared anymore. We know how to meet and unmute ourselves. Uh, so, and I think the meeting platforms have improved and I think we've gotten better at teaching over the past 15 months. It's the first time we really thought about like, how do we teach everything online? So I think we do, I think we have gotten better at it. And all of this technical, technological resistance, you know, lessening, as well as like the whole notion that's been developing over the past several years that people don't stick in the same careers. They need to develop new skills. They need to learn new technologies as they come out. Uh, between those two things, I just think there's a lot of opportunity. So if, if I was the head of a university, and thank God I'm not, uh, I would be thinking about how to continue re-engaging all these adult learners who decided to finally give it a try. I think, I think we're going to see a, a lot of movement in that space going forward, whether it's subscriptions to professional communities at, at universities or ongoing educational opportunities. Uh, I, I think there's a lot, a lot of opportunity here going forward. And uh, all of it includes generating more content, both in terms of on-demand video as well as live video. And if I can jump in, um, Ohio has a program that allows um, residents 60 and over to take courses, not for credit, but to be able to you know, audit a course. And we've seen really good adoption from that demographic as well, which you know, typically has not been one of the quickest to adopt groups. Yeah. Chris, you brought up some really interesting points. I, I didn't think about it. It's easy for me to, to get into my silo of higher education and the work I'm doing here and, and forget about that, that K-12 sector and, and what a huge difference um, students in maybe an inner city school experience from a, a more well-off uh, school that has one-to-one -one already employed. So um, that, that's something I'm going to have to reflect on a little bit. But for my experience, as far as Ohio State and higher ed, I think this was a, a huge win um, for us. And my, my career over the last several years um, has been working with instructors who have been told, hey, you have to teach online figure it out and me having to really encourage them and show them what's possible. And, and the fav the best part of my job is when that, that light bulb goes off and that epiphany moment of, Oh, I see how I can do this online. And it's not going to be the same experience as in person, but it could actually be improved and better. And, and for them to actually rethink how they teach in general. And so for years, it's been kind of a process getting them to buy in and see that, that opportunity. And then, the pandemic has just forced them to say, well, fit, you're going to have to figure this out, right? And so I think for a lot of them, it, it was very challenging. It was very stressful, but at least they, they see the opportunity of, oh, yeah, I, I guess I can do this. Um, maybe not great at first, but there are ways and opportunities, and the technology has come so far to, to help make it as easy as possible. So ultimately, I think it was a, a kind of a ripping a Band-Aid off, so to speak, um, and it, it definitely we had a sharp pain, but I'm so thankful of so many instructors who have told me for years that they could never teach online or their course could never be taught online is have seen how and what can be done. So, so, um, I, uh, so your truth in advertising, I, I serve on the board of the uh, Connecticut commission of educational technology. So, um, what we, what we've seen is, um, a, uh, an exposure of the digital divide. So for those that uh, have internet access, you know, broadband, the experience has been uh, great. I mean, I would comment that, you know, we've arrived or online learning has arrived um, when uh, Saturday Night Live is doing sketches about, uh, you know, Zoom and, and, and you know, the new experience. And, and you see that now, right? So, so this is mainstream, it's never going back. 
I think what's going to happen in the future is we're going to have a hybrid experience. Um, we have customers that do, for example, clinical assessment skills training, where you've got multiple cameras looking at, um, let's say, medical uh, um, mannequins, and the students are, are doing exercises on them. Well, you need to actually have physical access to that. So during the pandemic, they would come in, they'd have their masks, they, they would do their, their, their assessments, um, they could watch it online live, it's recorded, they can view it later, uh, um, but the classes are all online. Um, I think the other thing that, that's happened, you know, again, I think we'll ne never go back, is um, uh, the exposure of um, the, the, the weakest link. So, you know, our particularly K through 12 customers, they have a lot of premise-based systems, um, some cloud, but a lot of premise base for because they're integrated with Active Directory and, and a whole bunch of security issues. Um, you know, this has exposed the weakness in their network. So while we talk about teachers and perhaps even students being the heroes of education, to a large degree, the IT staff has really stepped up and, and performed some miracles in a, in a very short amount of time to get the, uh, the uh, technology working online. So uh, again, my, my uh, observation is, you know, it's a changed world. We're not going, there's the new normal is going to be hybrid. You're not just going back to school. You're also going to be uh, participating online. Well, that, that conversation brought up at least four really, really important points that we need to touch on. So uh, which order should we go through them? Let's, let's start with um, kind of the expanding of the, um, of the range of students that we need to address. So, uh, Chris mentioned uh, extension type um, uh, remote education of, uh, of adult learners and that sort of lifelong learning um, opportunities that have, uh, have created themselves, revealed themselves as a lot of people sheltered in place and they found that this is a great way to spend their time productively. And also uh, the K through 12 issue where some students will, be, will have fallen uh, behind. Some students um, didn't have access to the resources they need. Uh, a lot has changed in the past year, so Starlink is, a, is a amazing for those of us kind of in the north that um, now have access uh, in rural areas for uh, high-speed internet. Uh, in inner cities, like, you know, um, in the spring, Justin and I, or last spring, Justin and I talked about uh, what, our, what our campuses and cities were doing to uh, bridge the digital divide. Where should we, uh, where should we start there? Um, Justin, want to have an update on the, um, and the digital divide efforts in Columbus? Um, I'm not aware of a whole lot that's been done since the initial different deployments that we did. Um, Ohio State University has uh, enabled Wi-Fi in several of the large parking lots so that you know students were able to come and get you know, Wi-Fi there if they had bad connectivity, no connectivity, um, those sorts of things. Um, but since the spring, I'm not aware of any new major uh, deployments or initiatives that have changed. Um, we started to, you know, come back to campus more. I mean, there's not a lot of attendance uh, physically on campus, but, you know, there are people allowed back in labs and things like that. So, um, you know, we are starting to trickle back and, you know, there's all of the available connectivity robustly across campus as well as, um, actually, there was one, um, they, we have a very large common green space uh, on campus and they have enabled that with Wi-Fi. So it's no longer limited just to the buildings, so. Let me, let, let me add that um, uh, one of the things we've seen is a, um, an increase in the use of podcasting in, uh, in education, right? You, you normally think of podcast as something for, um, I don't know, for entertainment, you know, or, or for listening to an uh, audio book or, 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 or such. But um, at least on our platform, to the extent that you have all this educational content and it's organized in lessons and channels and so on, um, we have students that can uh, get to a, a place where they have adequate internet access. And commonly, that's a local library. So in the state of Connecticut, for example, every library has fiber put in by the state. And this is true in, in, in lots of places. So at least the student can, if they can get internet access, even temporarily, they can attach to a podcast and that content is downloaded to their phone. And then they can review the lessons, you know, at, or watch the videos at their leisure. So you don't 
you know, there, there's there's workarounds as we as we work toward getting broadband to everybody. That was that was especially useful when the buildings were closed. You could go to the outside them, but you couldn't go inside, and you wouldn't want to hang out there in the rain. But you could download the materials and then review offline at home. Yeah, Scott, Scott, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I'll chime in. Uh, you know, Rich, you mentioned earlier us, you know, this being the the new normal, right? And us not ever really going back to what education was. And I I'm I'm really hopeful that that's true. I've definitely had to have conversations with instructors here that are really excited to go back to teaching the way they used to teach. And, I, and, and I'm actually working on putting some resources together to say, wait, there is actually some silver linings in this that your students really appreciate. And here's a top 10 list of the things your students wanna see you keep doing um, and, and making sure that they don't go back to just the way things were. So I, I appreciate that call out. I think for us, the other thing that we've really pushed, you know, early on, a lot of instructors anticipated just walking into their empty lecture halls and simulcasting uh, their lectures. And we had to really strongly push back and say, that's, that's not what's gonna be successful for your students. Um, and, and you need to start pre-recording this content and making it available anytime and not just specific hours. We had students here at Ohio State that when campus closed, they had to fly all the way back to California. They had to fly all the way across the country or to an another country. And for us to expect them to get up at 6 a.m. for an 8 a.m. class here is not, it's not realistic, right? And so one of the things I really hope that we are gonna continue to address here at, at OSU and other universities is this flexibility and how do we make content flexible and accessible and attainable for students outside of the classroom? Because for us to expect them to always be connected to the internet if they're in rural or Appalachia somewhere, uh, and have access to the same content or have the same experience as someone sitting here in Columbus's Ohio State campus, campus with their device is, is not realistic. So flexibility is really something I, I'm hoping all instructors and, and instructional technologists, instructional designers work with our instructors to say, hey, let's not say we're taking attendance and you have to be in the seat every single course, but understand how they consume their content is really going to be personalized enough to them and, and be okay with that. Um, so those were the two big things uh, of thinking about how flexibility and how can we continue to flip the classroom now because we're pre-recording a lot of this content. How can we make the in-person experience different from what it was? How can we get that content to them ahead of time and make that in-person more of a collaborative time than uh, a talk and lecture time? So those are just a couple of things to chew on and, and respond to. So Scott, I want to I want to pick up on something that you had said just now, and also in the original uh, question, and that is my favorite part of, of the job is seeing the light go on at the end of a course development and seeing a teacher very very you know rejuvenated about teaching their their course, where it's like I I, I have things from a student centric perspective now that I've done this online uh, course. Um, but that's not how a lot of courses were made. A lot of courses weren't made the way that you and I would have uh, the teacher do it. They, they did the simulcast. They, they went in and the student had a fly on the wall type of perspective. And the, the thing that I'm most concerned about is in the K through 12 realm, that's pretty much what all students had. So all students, uh, because the teacher both has to fill the time to kind of you know, take care of the children, you know, like keep them occupied during the day is kind of like the, the dual role of a teacher. Um, they also needed to um, to teach. And so students that are coming in as, as uh, freshmen or, uh, you know, first year students, um, they would be, they would, they would have this uh, perception, this kind of bias about online courses that that's what it is, is that you, you have that simulcast experience. So what are you, what, what do you have plans for to kind of rehabilitate um, both incoming uh, classes and, and um, help teachers that kind of got into these, these habits to, to kind of, um, both, both do this for new new course builds and also for teachers that you helped. How do you how do you help them uh, transition back to in person or hybrid? That's that's such a good question. And for me, I'm really excited about this upcoming year and the and the opportunity to do this. So, the area that I work in, we focus specifically on um, Ohio State online programs, and so we we touch a lot of courses, but a very specific population of courses that are all online. And so for me, I'm really ramping up our thought and our effort of how do, we, how do we work with all the instructors around campus to give them the resources, to give them the coaching, to give them the tools to really rethink the way they are teaching moving forward. Um, and so for me, it's, we used to really focus on creating really um, high production value content for our online courses. And we have an amazing, Justin has an amazing team of producers that can produce amazing content. 
But as we scale, we, we can't produce that content for every course, every instructor and every piece of content. And so I'm really transitioning my team to take this supported DIY approach. And how can we teach these instructors to fish? I mean, when I started doing video um, and, and I graduated college in 2007, I spent $10,000 on two Canon cameras that now are giant paperweights because my iPhone shoots video eight times better than that. And um, it's right there in my pocket. I no longer need a, a super high-end, super premium and expensive computer to, to edit on. I no longer have to buy super expensive editing software. I, I no longer have to you know, put it on a VHS tape, but it's on, on YouTube and, and other media platforms. So our ability to create content has come such a long way that we need to help our instructors realize how attainable creating that content is, uh, one, and two, letting them understand, and this is another thing I think pandemic was a blessing that we can't let great get in the way of good. Your students don't need the most amazing piece of polished production. They just want the content. They're going to be watching it on their smartphone, riding on the bus. They're going to be watching it in between classes. They're not going to be watching it on a movie screen. So, so don't worry about all the technical detail when you're just producing content. So those are the things I'm really going to be focused on this year is, is teaching our instructors to fish, showing them um, the resources that are available to them already sitting in the desk drawer um, and, and doing that by example. So I've produced a, a lot of videos with this low production, low quality, you know, Justin mentioned, I think before we got on this call, there's a, there's a video out there of me teaching in my pajama shorts um, because it just shows that you can do this from anywhere. You don't have to be in your lecture hall. You can do it from your office. You can do it from your basement. Um, and you can have fun with it. Let your personality come through with it. So those are just a couple of things. I don't know if that's helpful for anyone. Um, but I'm excited for that opportunity to, to scale up this coming year and, and really help our instructors see what's possible moving forward and, and hopefully making that experience better for those students that are coming in who, who didn't have a great experience. I want to come back to some of what you said, but first I want to toss it to Rich because uh, we have the Big Ten and the Ivy League represented here, but Rich, Rich knows the K through 12 better than we do except, uh, you know, as parents for some of us. So Rich, what have, what have you seen and, and what is the direction moving forward? You mentioned hybrid and... Yeah, yeah, the, we, we, see, um, we see a lot of hybrid. As, as I mentioned, um, in the K through 12, at the, at the start of the pandemic, we saw a lot of IT scrambling to expose the systems that they have to the public internet. Everything was internally faced. Sometimes there's security laws Right, that um, you you know, it's important that uh, um, a child's face, name, whatever, is never on the internet. It's, it's sometimes it's it's a bit extreme. So dealing with that and 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 getting these systems exposed to the public internet when perhaps they were previously purely inside the firewall. So all of that sort of stuff, and then it's hybridized. One of the things that we've seen is, and I think it's a little bit about what, 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 uh, what Scott was mentioning, is uh, we have a lot of schools that do lecture capture. So in, in the more affluent schools, they may have two cameras in a lecture hall, you know, one at the instructor podium, uh, an, another one, maybe a larger view, and then they uh, simultaneously have the, uh, the uh, laptop screen, you know, also captured. So, uh, that is automatically streamed so you can watch that live online and have synchronous learning and have chat and all that sort of stuff. Then it's recorded and you can have VOD, you know, afterward. Why am I saying this? Well, because what we've seen is the instructor, what they're presenting on their laptop often is a video. And then it's not a, much of a leap for, for, the, for them or for us to explain to them, you know, if you take that video, which is the bulk of your class and add some annotations and some some narration to it you know you can make a course and you don't even have to be here right they thought that was a pretty good idea so we, we certainly have seen you know the migration and the, and the lights going on in in, the, in a lot of the teachers um but again in the in the k through 12 space um the digital divide tends to you know rear its ugly head a lot um uh, but we also have a lot of uh, teachers, typically the younger teachers, you know, who were born into the internet as opposed to the uh, people my age, right? Um, internet, is that still around, right? That, <laughs> there's some of those um, uh, that, that embrace the, the whole uh, notion of, uh, 
of a flipped classroom, right? That, that term flipped classroom was very popular. That was going to be the next thing about five years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, and then it, it just didn't happen. Uh, I think the pandemic has sort of turned the light on and, and we're actually beginning to see people, yeah, that hybrid may be the execution of the flipped classroom uh, notion. We have an interesting question from the audience that is, uh, what kind of streaming media platforms are uh, our schools and campuses relying on? So, um, Chris, you want, to, you want to start with that one? And you're muted. Sure. Uh, okay. Well, well we, uh, we use uh, Canvas as our LMS, and we have integrated into that uh, a media cloud media service called Panopto. Uh, and that's for uploading video. You can do live video through it as well, but it, it's nice because it provides automatic transcriptions. It also will convert your video or your audio file, uh, well, audio file, it will convert your video file into a podcast audio only format. So if you just wanna listen to the audio of it, that's provided. I know that just came up not so long ago, uh, but the, the real win is that it integrates very nicely into into Canvas and, and anything you do in Panopto is, is very easy to, to port between the two. Use that for live streaming events too? Uh, well, you can use that for, for, for live. Uh, out of the writer's house where we're doing more public facing events, we're typically streaming to YouTube live. Okay, and Justin at Ohio State? Uh, for the, um, for a bulk of the course materials, uh, we're using Canvas as our LMS front end as well. Um, for the bulk of the uh, content videos for the courses, we're using a locally hosted um, instance of media site, um, which you know, is very similar to Panopto. And then we're using a mix of YouTube and Vimeo for kind of everything else. And we're seeing a little bit of a split where a lot of the um, program, the courses that comprise the online programs are being hosted in YouTube whereas the media site is getting a lot of the videos for kind of every other course. Um, and I, I do expect that to shift eventually because Ohio State is doing a big initiative to move all of their general education classes online as well. So that's gonna have hundreds of courses coming online and you know, moving into one of those two platforms or three, you know, the big, the big difference that we've seen between YouTube and Vimeo is YouTube is signed more as, you know, a, a social and um, content discovery platform. So you can't, if, if you change your video file, you have to you know, make some sort of rudimentary change or correction, you get generate a brand new URL for it. Whereas Vimeo, you can actually just replace the file and the URL doesn't break. And you use a uh, media site for live or YouTube again? Um, most of the, you can, you can do both. Um, most of the live stuff that I've seen has gone through YouTube okay. or Vimeo. And then for asynchronous? Um, basically the same. Um, it's um, split between the two. Um, just the, the online, dedicated online programs are favoring YouTube and everything else is favoring media site. And then Rich, can you kind of describe your, uh, the technology stack that you, your, your products rely on? Well, our customers obviously use Discover Video Right. Mm -hmm. So, and, and what we have is a whole suite of uh, solutions from, from the encoders, you know, our, our Scorpions, our, our, our um, multi channel lecture capture, you know, encoder boxes that stream and record live uh, to either premise, small, medium, large premise, or cloud uh, uh, systems. Um, yeah. And we compete with everybody with uh, Panopto and, and we integrate with Canvas and all of that too. And many of our customers do that. Um, and then we have uh, all of the players. So uh, while, while um, uh, you know, if you're obviously, if you're, if you're uh, uh, viewing content from home, you're going to view it in a web page. If you're uh, trying to reach 10,000 people on a campus, you know, our web page can launch a multicast player as well. So there, there's a lot of technology in the whole suite that we offer. Okay. So you have multicast and presumably oh, yeah. HL, HLS. And HLS, that. RTMP, RTSP, all the protocols, everything is, is there, um, all secured, you know, glass to glass uh, encryption, um, which is why a lot of the financials and, you know, corporations use uh, Discover Video as well. But in education, you know, I think the key is it's got to be simple. 
you know, the, you know, if, if, uh, so, you know, if, if you mention to a consumer, oh, I want to stream some video, you know, they go YouTube, right? And teachers are consumers. So if they, if it's, if it's, uh, if you're going to give them anything more difficult than what they already know, YouTube, um, then they're not going to use it. You know, they're going to, they're going to move around and, and, uh, post content where you get Budweiser commercials in the middle of your video and they don't, they don't like that. So, so, you know, they, they like to use the private, uh, uh, systems, you know, for their content because it's secured. You can measure who's viewing it. You can build testing, you know, right into the videos. Um, so again, it's a, it's a comprehensive suite of, of, uh, of end to end products. Mm -hmm. The HLS is definitely like the dominant, you know, it's kind of lower, lowest common denominator type of protocol. Which is like well, you know, HLS, yeah. I mean, HLS, who would have thunk, right, uh, at the time, right, uh, Apple uh, came out with that, that um, doing little tiny recordings and stitching them together in a playlist was, uh, was going to be, uh, was going to be a thing. Um, you know, I, I bet on Silverlight right at the time. That was actually a superior technology, I thought. But it's fine. We we do HLS, so we depend on HLS now. Um, the problem, of course, with HLS is it is inherently high delay, and you know not great if you're going to be doing interactive, right, video. Um, so we also have low delay technologies that um, you know gives you sub second latency for your live video. It's also pretty poor for keeping the toothpaste in the tube. It's it's an easy. Everybody uses it, the ubiquity, to, and also the design of it just makes it really easy for people to rip your streams. Yeah, yeah, That's... exactly. So, so we're you know we're using Zoom for this conference, um, but the cheap seats, right? What I call the cheap seats, you know, the people who just want to view only, they're not going. You know, delay is just not something that that matters to you know uh, viewers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, streaming it via HLS and and other streaming technologies makes a. Uh, a tremendous amount of sense, right? So, it, it's why uh, Netflix and, and HBO doesn't use Zoom, right? They use mm -hmm. streaming technologies. So something that I'm curious about moving forward and something that the, the, the questioner had kind of in mind was as, um, as the demand, as the volume of the video that we deliver uh, scales down, will we be able to switch from you know uh, HLS and kind of broadcast oriented things to something a little bit more uh, secure, innovative boutique? Let's get back to um, the question, the, or what Scott was talking about, where uh, we're we're coming back, we're re um, reasserting the way that we uh, make videos and that sort of thing. And I have a question that I think Justin might be good to answer: is um, what are we doing as far as uh, studio spaces? So, like, there's a there's a tradition in the history of warfare to always fight the last battle, or always always fight the last little war. You know, you build up the army to handle the last the last war. So, what are we doing to prevent that error from happening? Uh, well, so studio-wise, um, on campus, we have a handful of studios where they are built as turnkey. You can walk in, you can, uh, um, you know, the initial design was you bring your flash drive in, you plug it in. Um, they were based off of um, the Penn State uh, One Touch Studio, um, where we have lights, we have a couple different backdrops, we've got, you know, one or more cameras, but it is really, a, you walk in, you hit the big go button, you do your recording and you hit stop and then you get your file and if you need to trim it you know you can do that but really it's intended for a you know you don't need to be any more uh versed in the technology than push the big green button push the red red big red button um and you can do you know chroma key is built into it as well but um we uh, built uh, light boards with those as well so people can you know annotate you know over themselves over you know chroma keyed video you're just basically draw right in the air and, you know, incorporate that as well. But th we're keeping it as simple as possible for any of the instructors or even students that need to, to come in and do that. We still have, you know, some traditional high-end studio spaces as well for the videos that do warrant, you know, a bigger or higher level of production quality, but. That's, that's a similar kind of trajectory to what we've had here. So here we have like our main studio that we can do anything and we can have multiple staff supporting the teacher and then, a lot of the times after a teacher makes an online course with us, they feel very comfortable with it. And we can, we can send them into these sort of what we call one button studios where it's a simpler space, a lot easier for uh, somebody to use themselves. And so the, the room that I'm in right now 
is kind of one of those spaces. So here I am, and uh, there's a lightweight uh, light grid. There's a, a light board on the floor here that I built for less than two hundred dollars, and uh, but it's a but it's a simpler space. Uh, it's very flexible, versatile, and it doesn't cost a ton of money to build. And so this is kind of like the um, the way that we had anticipated things going, anyways. And now that everybody's made um, now that everybody's become a teacher on video, um, you know, these these this thing seems to be like the kind of the kind of place that more people would want, where they can they can take what they learned and just completely up the game production wise by by using the space. Uh, Scott, yeah, just to build on that. So you know, what I mentioned before, helping instructors see that you know they don't need to let great get in the way of good. And so for us, as we scale up the support more and more. Um, we will continue to use these um, really high end production studios for our marketing promotional content, but when it comes to instructional content, creating um, really, you know, Rich, you talked about this, we need to make it as easy as possible for an instructor to go in there by themselves and be able to hit record and create content is, is what's key. Otherwise, they're not going to go use it. And I know, I know a lot of instructors are coming back ready to start getting into those spaces. So. I have a lot of colleges reach out to me and say, hey, we want to put in a studio. We want to put in a studio. And I, I try to encourage them to, to pump the brakes because you don't want to necessarily make one $50,000 studio when you could actually make 10 $5,000 studios and make them very simple, very user-friendly, very low budget. Um, and so that's what I'm really encouraging people to do is not invest in one really expensive technical space. Um, there is a need for that, but to focus on these more easy um, walk in, not intimidating, very easy to use um, space that you can update regularly. I mean, we know as, as video producers, the stuff that we're buying now in five years, we're gonna be wanting to update anyway, right? And so, so don't invest your money in that. You know, the other thing that we have is um, we're investing in these like video run bags. You can't really see it with my background, but essentially it's a, a video kit for your iPhone or your smartphone that you can basically check out and get good audio, good video, and good quality um, just in a bag. And so those are things that we're providing instructors. Um, so that way we're not giving them a $5,000 camera and saying, please don't break this. We're just giving them the, the peripherals to support what technology they have, whether it's an iPad or a smartphone and teaching them how to, how to do it. So hope that helps. Yeah. Meet them where they're at's a good way to start. Um, one of the kind of draws and one of the one of the legitimate reasons to build the fifty thousand dollars studio though is like, you know, you want to be able to support the hybrid model. You want to support um, something where there are there's a remote audience and then there's a live studio audience. And uh, you know, there's a, I've seen these in a few universities, um, not so much K through twelve, but like they have like you know the big video wall and then in the you know in the marketing brochures it's just all these interested faces on there instead of just like you know the the static images because they have the cameras turned off that sort of thing but it looks great do you see anything like that being done or do you do you see a future for that anybody uh, on the panel may, may answer chris i i think we're going to see requests definitely for that that hybrid scenario and i'm not sure that the requests are going to come from people who understand the the tech <laughs> that needs to be uh, invested in to make that happen like I, I think i see a lot of events that were in person went online and now they're like, ah, we kind of like doing online. Can we just like put a Zoom laptop in the front row and just have, have that be our, our interactive Zoom stream? And uh, I don't know, you know, it, it's definitely that challenge of if you're going to do it, you know, you, you, if you, you don't want to do two things mediocre instead of, you know, one thing good, like an all in person or all live. It, it, to, to do the interactive thing is going to be really difficult. And I, I do think we're going to see request for it. And I'm not sure how to make it happen in the immediate future, but I think we're going to see, uh, see, see that coming forth, forth, forthcoming. Yeah, hybrid is going to be such a tough nut to crack because it really takes two lesson mm -hmm. plans and then they have to synergize. You know, you have to have the remote audience, you know, the, the tools that work there, like polls and other, you know, Zoom features that can kind of inform the in-person audience and have it work in some way that they, they play off each other in some way that makes it better than, than the sum of the parts, that sort of thing. And it just, it's such an enormous workload on the, on the faculty member that I think that the way that it'll play out is kind of like what you said, where it's, if a student's sick and has to be in quarantine, you just set up the laptop in the front row and like, there's, oh, this is all I can Let me, let, go, let go me just chime in with, uh, with, with a quick thought. My, I learned something from my father 50 years ago. I, I 
yeah, it's probably 40 or 50 years ago when I walked into the living room and I saw him watching a football game. Uh, I think the New York Giants, he was a fan of the New York Giants that are recorded on VHS tape using super long, you know, mode, super long speed, right? And I looked at the TV and it was, you, could, you couldn't make out the numbers of the players. It was so grainy and terrible and he's watching it. And that was a lesson to me that it's the content you know, the quality of the, the quality of the video is really a lot less important than the content that you're delivering. You know, if he's willing to watch this horrible quality, you know, it, he's enjoying the content. And I think that's a lesson to, uh, to, to educators and everybody about the need to build expensive studios. Yes, there's a place for that. Absolutely. But it's, it's, the, it's the quality of the content, not the quality of the video that's more important. We have a we have a giant poster on the door going into our main studio that says "Let the content lead," and uh, that's that's kind of the motto. And it was true, you know, 50 years ago when your father said it to you, and it's true now when you know little kids like to watch unboxing videos and videos of other kids playing with toys instead of playing with them themselves or whatever. Um, we had a question about um, over the top. So are we? Uh, Rich, do you want to go ahead and just yeah, real, real, real quick. So uh, over the top, it was, su suggests um, uh, an alternative to the traditional broadcast network. At least that's how I think about it. So uh, our customers, we give them a Roku channel. So you can, uh, if you have Roku, you can uh, add your channel and you can view all of your content in your home on your little Roku box. Uh, we've done something similar with Samsung, right? So Samsung TVs. Um, you know, uh, so, so yeah, that is absolutely used in, in education. Anything that allows the content to reach the intended audience as easily as possible is a good thing. Let's um, kind of back up a little bit and say, what, what role does lecture capture play stepping forward? So I think uh, Ohio State has media sites, so lecture capture is a major feature of that. So we're talking about cameras in the classroom, screen recordings, and it all gets kind of automated into something that the students have available to them afterwards. So do we see that as um, an augmentation of the in-person experience so that they can review a solution for a hybrid or the way that things looked you know, last spring where it was like, well, that's just how I'm gonna do my production. We'll simulcast to the remote audience. I feel like that's a really hard question to answer because every instructor is going to approach it a little bit differently and think a little bit differently. I know for us, um, obviously, with um, I am encouraging instructors to use their their in person class as a studio space for their online students and not necessarily thinking about hey I'm going to teach my in person class like I always do and the online students can be a fly in the wall, but teach your in person class for the online students and let the students that are there in the class kind of experience it um, that way. Sounds really strange, but I've seen it done really successfully with instructors who actually have their students have their device out in the class and they're watching the Zoom um, and they're interacting with the chat with the students online. And they're actually even doing group discussions in small groups uh, with the students that are online and the students that are in class. And so I think it really just takes a fundamental rethinking of what that in-person class time is and how we utilize it and really thinking online first um, rather than online last. Um, so that's the things that I'm coaching. I think that's gonna be a, a really hard uh, paradigm to shift. Um, but I, I think as we've seen more and more um, of the kind of live streaming of lectures, um, we're not necessarily thinking of it as we need to have three cameras in a giant lecture hall simulcasting a, a, a lecture, but, you know, I'm also trying to coach instructors to get away if they're pre-recording their content, they don't have to spend 45 minutes lecturing to their PowerPoint. They can break it down into five or 10 minute sections. Uh, when you're in person, you don't lecture for 45 minutes. You might lecture technically for 25 or 30, and then a lot of that's broken up with transitions. A lot of it's broken up with discussions and questions. Um, so getting them to understand and think what they actually are, are lecturing on and how to break that up. So it's not just some 45 minute, 60 minute lecture that your students aren't gonna watch. I'll be honest, I'm sorry, they're not gonna watch it. Um, so 
Speaking to K through 12 teacher friends of mine that's, that have been teaching hybrid all along, that's been the biggest problem that they've had. Like they say, you always feel like you're neglecting one of the groups, you know, the online group or the in-person group, and you always feel bad at the end of the day. And so what your advice is, is um, prefer the online group and, and, and just let the in-person group enjoy the show a little bit. It's a live studio audience, uh, just kind of run with that and, and do it. I think that I think that's probably as good of advice as you can as you can get. You know, if you've ever lectured to a, a, a live audience in, a, in an auditorium and you look out in the audience, most people are like this anyway, right? So. <laughs> lean, lean on into it. Like, yeah. Bring your own device. Let me, uh, uh, I, let I do want to say. Mention, let me just mention on, on lecture capture. Um, I always, uh, to the extent, you know, the easiest thing to do is, is what we what we've been doing, right? Everybody's resistant to change. I think it's just a, a human condition. And I think the natural propensity of, of educators when they think about distance learning is to replicate the classroom remotely, right? To replicate that lecture experience remotely. I don't know about you, but I hated going to lectures, right? In school, right? It, was, it wasn't necessarily the best way to learn. So I think educators, and again, I think a lot of the younger ones in particular, um, you know, are beginning to embrace the new technology and say, what's the best way to learn? Lecturing and replicating a classroom experience remotely isn't always the best way to, uh, to, to learn. It may be in a lab experience, right, or demonstration experience, um, but perhaps not in a, in a history class. Chris, did you want to say something? Uh, I, I just wanted to mention that uh, Penn, at this point in time, has, has announced they, they don't plan to do any hybrid you know, people in person and people remote in the same class, uh, at, at least for the, the, the upcoming semester. Uh, so they're sticking with either online or in person. I do see that, you know, if you can capture your lecture, uh, everyone is so used to recording and having those recordings available. Students have gotten used to that. Instructors have gotten used to having that. I, I, I feel like if they have that option, instructors would want to take advantage of that if they're in a room that has it for time shifting, for looking back on, for students who couldn't make a class. Uh, so I, 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 would, I, I would envision seeing instructors liking to have that option available going forward either way. Just one more thing to toss in that kind of Scott brought up was, uh, we've talked a bit about flipping the classroom, which is kind of like the classic thing to do. If you develop an online course, you really like your material, and then for the in-person course, you flip it. You have, you have the students watch the videos beforehand, and then in, in person, you. Uh, you go through it. And I've kind of uh, written this before, but that doesn't work well for K through 12 because it's just so demanding on the kids' times. They're in school for six to eight hours a day anyways. You know, you really need to use that time. So um, Scott mentioned the, the micro lecture where, you know, your lecture should be five, 10 minutes. So you can do that in person. You could flip the class in person, play a five minute video, do an activity. And while that's going on, you can attend to the remote audience. So that's one other um, option. And then <clears throat> do we want to talk about any, um, Unusual use cases that we've seen over the last year, or shall we discuss accessibility? Because that's a really, really important thing. And I think that a lot has changed in the last year. Uh, I mean, I, I think the use case I shared a little while ago about the instructor who actually has his in-person students on Zoom in the in-person class, you know, obviously they have their, their, their mic muted and the volume turned down. Uh, was just an interesting dynamic. And so that way it really encouraged, you know, half the class is virtual and at home, the other half of the class is in person, but they're all having a pretty much similar experience and being able to do small groups with the students that are in the in-person class alongside the students are, that are, are at home was, was just a really cool thing for me to see. Um, and I'd, I'd love to see that kind of outside the box thinking. The other thing I want to add on, you know, Rich, you, you mentioned instructors in us all, you know, human nature wanting to keep doing what we've always done, right? And I think we've really created a, 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 a culture in education that teachers aren't really encouraged to try new things or experiment or fail forward. Um, I think we put a lot of pressure on, um, especially in higher ed with, you know, tenure track faculty, they don't want to try anything new because if they get a bad SEI, that that doesn't reflect on them, right? And so we don't have this good culture for instructors to really think outside the box or push their boundaries. And in higher or in K-12, you know, you have parents that are going to be 
griping and complaining and, and talking about, well, the teacher doesn't know what they're doing when really they're just trying to, to stretch and, and do something new to engage in the students. So any way that we can encourage our instructors to, to be okay with trying something, they're not sure how it's going to go and being open with their students on what that experience might be like. And Scott, I would, I would assume that in, in, uh, in, in your case and perhaps all the, everybody's case, um, the controversy about recording the lecture or the content and who owns the, the lecture, who owns the content has been settled. I mean, that for, for, for a long time, you know, that was the, the instructor, the professor didn't want his class recorded because he wanted to get paid each time it was, you know, played, right? Mm -hmm. Is that settled down with everybody? There's no, there's no royalties changing hands, that's for sure. But there is, uh, most schools would have an intellectual property agreement with the teacher about who gets yeah. to use what. And, and if they move on to another school, do they get to take their things and that sort of thing? Yeah, we had, I mean, that was a big thing for, I would say, a good year or two with while they were trying to figure that out. But I, they pretty much settled on, we kind of co-own. If you leave, you can take the content with you, but you also have to leave the content here for us to, to continue to utilize it. Um, I think the big thing, you know, five years ago when we started coming in and really started pushing online for the first time, instructors had this huge defense of, well, you're just going to record all my stuff and then fire me. <laughs> it's like, no, we need, we still need you. We still need your expertise. We still need your coaching and guidance. Uh, we just want to make it more attainable for more people. Um, so. And then the question of accessibility before we wrap, uh, Justin, do you want to chime in on that? Um, well, I mean, the, the big thing is that it's with the pandemic, it's pushed all of that to the forefront. You know, it's made the need for it much more, you know, uh, everybody much more aware of the need for it. Um, you know, especially things like the minimum level of accuracy, which, you know, a lot of the products that can auto caption things while they're quite good and, you know, getting better very quickly, a lot of them don't hit quite that benchmark of, you know, the minimum accuracy, um, as well as the cost for it. Um, you know, there's ways to do it, you know, cheap or free, but that's not, you know, scalable, you know, getting a YouTube auto caption and having a student clean it up or something of that nature, that nature. So there's a big budgetary issue as well. And, you know, I mean, while that can get exorbitant at times, depending on, on your scale, it is a cost of business, cost of doing business. So, um, but you know our, our um, ADA office has been you know very vocal and you know encouraging, making sure everybody is getting live captioning done for any of the live events and any of that nature. So um, you know, and it doesn't help just um, people you know that need specific um, disability um, accommodations. You know, if you're in a noisy situ situation, you know, um, captions are going to benefit you there. So there's um, you know um, English as a second language. ADHD, there's a plethora of people and situations that would benefit from those, so. Yeah, those, those go bags that um, Scott was talking about where it's got a microphone that you can plug onto your iPhone, like that's gonna make such a dramatic improvement just downstream when it comes to captioning and everything, that you have good, clean audio, it's so important. Yeah, let me let me just add that, um, you know, I think uh, while ADA is obviously important and, and, um, and the right thing to do, um, the, when, when all of your content is captioned, it's instantly searchable. So you can go into our system, I, I think other systems, and, oh, uh, and, and search the entire library for how many times Trump has been uttered, right? <laughs> you could find all the videos, right? And, and do some, even some statistical analysis on word usage in the videos. So it, it also makes it a, a searchable, uh, more readily searchable uh, content database. Yeah, dis discoverability is what got us where we are today. It's, you know, Google has the, has the money to put into getting the, the big data to, uh, to get the accuracy that we have today. Eric, it looks like you're here with the crook. Yeah, I hate to, I hate to give you the hook. As, as Christopher just said uh, to the panelists, this could go on for several more hours. Yeah. But uh, you managed to cover a lot in an hour. And we really appreciate it. Thanks to all the panelists. Thanks to the audience for such great questions. And thanks again to our diamond sponsor, Signiant, for helping make this possible. We'll see you at our next session, which is a group of tech talks, uh, diving in deep to some of the technical challenges facing the industry. Thanks again. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. When the director calls action. And action. When the game is on. Kick it up. It's good. 
or it's time to save the universe again. Media Shuttle is there. Trusted by more than 25,000 media companies, Media Shuttle delivers, making it easy and secure to send any size file anywhere fast. The journey begins with Media Shuttle portals, customized and branded for any project and designed to be so easy, your end users will love it. All while giving operations teams complete control through a simple yet powerful admin interface. Add users, set permissions, customize file delivery specs, and report on all activity. Blast off with proprietary acceleration technology. Media Shuttle moves your content anywhere in the internet connected world at hyper speeds. Along the way, your files are protected. Our commitment to enterprise grade security has made Media Shuttle a preferred tool with Hollywood studios, major sports leagues, broadcasters, and more. With Media Shuttle, your files are never handed over to Signet. File movement is orchestrated between the end user's workstation and your storage, whether on prem or in the cloud. Your IT team simply provisions your storage, connecting it to the Media Shuttle cloud service, and Signet handles the rest. Get started on your Media Shuttle journey today a journey without limits.